It's a pleasure to be with you this morning. Um, I've been in Campbell River for about eight years at Mennonite Brethren Church. And when we first arrived in Campbell River, the Discovery Church that I'm the pastor of was meeting in a community center similar to this. And so it's very familiar to me and know what it's like. And um, just it's a whole story of how God moved us out from there. But I'm privileged to be with you. I got to know Joe a little bit through the pastors on the island, getting together for prayer and different times and conferences. And of, um, as the church was planted, we followed a little bit of the history. And so it's been good to just connect with Joe and to be here with you. A few weeks ago, our associate pastor was with you leading worship, um, Dave Dixon. So that was, it's great to form a connection between our churches. Well, this morning, I, I want to be, uh, us to delve into this passage. It's such a vital, important topic, because in our society, so many people are saying, well, was Jesus really God? I mean, was he really? Did he ever really claim to be God? And if we, uh, we've been going through this series this summer um, in Campbell River, looking at some of the statements that Jesus made and letting Jesus speak for himself so that we hear it in his own words. And as you follow the I am statements of Jesus through the book of John, you find that many times he uses this and he speaks and he's claiming deity. He's claiming that he is God, but he fills it in and he adds to it for our understanding. And so this morning, as we look at this passage, there's one little phrase that stands out to me. And I hope that after we leave here this morning, it'll stand out to you as well. There's just the two words, just as, just as. Well, we'll get into what that means in just a moment. But I want us to pray and ask God to just be with us as we open his words. Father, we thank you that we can gather here in the name of the risen Lord. And we ask that you, by your Holy Spirit, would be with us this morning to open our ears. Lord, it's your word we want to hear. And any words that are not of yours, Lord, this morning, would you just allow them to pass away? But Lord, those words that you would speak to us, may they stand out. May you impress them on us that we would be changed and transformed. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Well, the passage that we're going to be focusing on, and I'll be taking us through a number of scriptures, but it was just read to uh, to us. But there was, we've got a problem right off. Right off the top, Jesus makes the claim that he is the good shepherd. Well, in our society, what does good really mean? I mean, a lot of times if we are talking about a restaurant and we, well, it's got good food. We're wanting to hear great. We're wanting to go to some places, not just good, but some place that is really fantastic. And that's the same way we talk to someone and we say, well, how are you doing this morning? Oh, good. I'm okay. And that's sort of the context that we have in it. But I mean, why doesn't Jesus call himself the great shepherd or the supreme shepherd? But he calls himself the good shepherd in this passage. You know, if you sort of right click um, good in your iPhone or whatever, it gives you some synonyms and you find words that are things like, well, it's um, decent or respectable wholesome you know it's just sort of vanilla it's no one that doesn't stand out and yet God well he is all those and Jesus is all those he's much much more this and so this morning I want us to look at Jesus as the good shepherd what does he mean I mean he doesn't mean that he's just decent He doesn't mean that, well, you know, he's respectable. 
I think he's wanting to say more than that to us this morning. And Ray, you know, he's wanting to say in a world that of false shepherds, he's the true shepherd. In a world that is just ordinary or wrapped up in phoning us, he's the true shepherd. He's all these things. And so I want to focus this morning on what does it mean or what does Jesus mean when he says that he is the good shepherd? Why is he the good shepherd? As Kevin uh, read the scripture for us, you may have noticed that there's two times that he makes the claim that I am the good shepherd. And so I believe there's two reasons that we find, just fall out of the text for us of why he is the good shepherd. The first one we find right there in verse 11. By the way, I'm preaching from the New International Version, so if most of you have the English uh, Standard Version, it might be just slightly different, but I believe we'll be able to follow along. In verse 11, Jesus makes the statement that I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. And that's the first reason that I see that we can really see and understand that Jesus is the good shepherd. I mean, it seems like a pretty straightforward verse. And yet right off as you dig into it, even in this, we've got another problem. Because you see, a good shepherd, if he was out looking at the flock, would not willingly lay down his life for the sheep. Of course, in the course of danger, there would be times that something, a dangerous animal would come. And in the course of trying to protect the sheep, they might lose their life. But they wouldn't intentionally lay down their life for the sheep in the sense of just going, I surrender. Because then the sheep would be scattered and pray to all the animals and anything that would wish to harm them. And so Jesus is saying here, he did lay down his life. He laid down his life for his sheep. And, and we sort of look at that and we say, well, why? You know, what's, what's behind this? And you see, you have to understand, I've got three children. And um, they're mostly grown up they're from, what, 34 to about 22 now. But if there was a need for me to give up my life for them, I'd willingly, willingly do it. I love them. I care for them. But you see, there would need to be a reason why I'd need to do it as well. I, I wouldn't just voluntarily go and I lay down my life for no reason. And so as we look at this, we understand that Jesus does this. He lays down his life because they are his sheep. They are his sheep. It, look again at this passage. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep, it says in verse 11. In verse 14, it says, I am the good shepherd and I know my sheep and my sheep know me. And really we want to double back and we want to understand the passage or this verse in the context. And so you go back to earlier in the chapter to verses 3 to 5 and we find this. It says, the gatekeeper opens the gate for him. This is talking about the shepherd, the one that's looking after the sheep. And the sheep listen to his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought them all out, all, on, all of his own, he goes on ahead of them and his sheep follow him because they know his voice. But they will never follow a stranger. In fact, they will run from him because they do not recognize a stranger's voice. So he died for his own sheep. And I think we understand that. Even as I indicated, I saw many that were in accord. You would die for your own children. Of course you would. But just to sort of understand this in a different level, to put a different picture on it, imagine for a moment that you've been a manager of XYZ Widget Company for 38 years. You've been, uh, you know, maybe even a manager of the company, but it's Christmas morning 
Christmas Day and all of your family are gathered together for the Christmas dinner and you're just about to sit down and, and meanwhile back at the factory the watchman has been wandering looking around as he's supposed to be doing and he sees within the main fa- uh, building a glow and flickering and he knows exactly what's going on. He, he grabs his cell phone and the top number is yours and he calls you up and says, I think there's something you may want to know that's going on down here. Well, you see, one of your responses at that point might be, well, have you called the owner yet? Have you called the one that really has a financial interest in this? Because I'm sitting down with my family right now, and that's not my priority. You call the owner. But if you're the owner, you're doing what? You're, call, you're racing down there to see if there's anything you can salvage. And you see, that's what this is saying. If you're just a hired man in the the carrying of the sheep, when the enemy comes, when the wolf or the lion comes, you're you're out of there. You're not giving up your life for those sheep. You're just the the hired person. But Jesus is saying he is the owner of the sheep. Where does that ownership come from? I want us to just see three ways that Jesus established in his ownership. In John 15, verse 16, it says, You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you might go and bear fruit, fruit that will last, and so that whatever you ask in my name, the Father will give me. The first reason, the first cause for ownership is that Jesus chose us. Jesus chose you and I to be his sheep to be the ones that he would die for, the ones that he would care for. You were chosen by God. But secondly, we see that the Father gave them, gave us to Jesus. And we see this in the high priestly prayer coming in a few chapters in John 17, verse 6. I have revealed you to those whom you gave me out of the world. They were yours, you gave them to me, and they have obeyed your word. So Jesus chose us, and we were given to him by God the Father, his Father. But thirdly, he bought us. He bought us. You see, over in 1 Corinthians 6... We see this language of ownership again. Do you not know that your bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. Uh, Why, Paul? Why do you say that we are not our own? Well, he goes on. You were bought at a price. Therefore, glorify God with your body. So there's a transaction that is take place. Why is Jesus the good shepherd? Jesus is the good shepherd because he is our shepherd. He has ownership of us. He cares for us. And using that analogy that he would die, we would die for our own family. And so why did Jesus die for his family? For those that were his own? Like I said, there had to be a reason. Some reason. And so what was the reason that Jesus needed to die for you and I? What was the reason? Of course, we find this in Scripture as well. It's laid out all through Scripture. We were in mortal danger. We were in danger. You see, every friend, and I know Joe preaches this. Ever since creation from the fall of man, man has been going his own way rather than God's way. And man's way, because we're in opposition to God, is the way of destruction and death. And you see, even today, we find that we are in mortal danger. And Jesus is addressing this. And Jesus speaks of this as he's talking in this passage. If you were to go back even more to get context here, who is Jesus addressing in this, this little speech? He's addressing some of the religious aristocracy of the Jewish people. 
In chapter 9, he's talking, um, he's healed the man that was blind, and, and the leaders were saying, well, who was it that was blind? And they were ready to put him out of the church, out of the synagogue, because he, he wasn't a, uh, saying who had healed him. And because Jesus had healed him on the Sabbath. And you see, they, they were about to put him out, and Jesus is saying, you're not good shepherds. You like to think that you're good shepherds, but it goes back to Ezekiel 34, which I'm not going to go to this morning, but where God talks about there being bad shepherds over the Israel and that there would come a time when the good shepherd would appear who would care for the sheep. And this is all in the context of the scriptures. Jesus is addressing why he is the good shepherd. And so what was the need There is the charge of legal indebtedness to to death. Paul talks about this in Colossians 2. In Colossians 2 verse 13, he says, When you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive in Christ. But that's Jesus, the good shepherd. He forgave us all our sins, having done what? Having canceled the legal indebtedness which stood against us and condemned us. What is this, this charge of legal indebtedness? He's taken it and away by nailing it to the cross. What's he done? We have sinned and we've created this this legal record that was going to condemn us to death, eternal separation from God, and he's canceled that on the cross. That's good news. He's taken that away. You see, unlike those that would give up their own lives to kill others and destroy others in a bomb or something, He's died to take away the sin of the world so that we might have life. The cross was not a tragic accident. The cross was the reality of, of the father who loves his sheep to death. That, that he'll always love us. He'll never let us go. He'll always care for us. And we have safety and security in him. Because... He's absorbed the wrath of the Father that was meant for us. But here's the irony of the the paradox, really, of what I spoke of before. You see, a shepherd giving down and giving up his life, and the sheep normally scatter. But what happens when Jesus died for us? We're told that... When he died, when he was lifted up, John 12 talks about this, that when he is lifted up from the earth, he will gather all people unto him. He gathers through his death. And so Jesus is good because the first reason that he lays down his life for the sheep. The second reason we find right after his second declaration here in John 10 of him being the good shepherd. In verse 14, I am the good shepherd. Why? I know my sheep and my sheep know me. You see, this is the second reason. First of all, he laid down his life for them. But the second reason that he's a good shepherd is because there is a gift of intimacy in a relationship. What kind of relationship do we have with this shepherd? Verse 14 and 15. I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and my sheep know me just as... There's that just as. Just as the Father knows me and I know the Father. Do you see that? Just as. They're crucial words. I mean, they're packed so much into this. I I want us to grasp this as we're going to be celebrating communion to, to understand the relationship that he has laid out and brought us into as believers. What kind of relationship? It's a just as relationship. 
just as the type of intimacy and relationship that Jesus had with his father, the same type of relationship. And what kind of intimacy and closeness was that? Jesus and the father enjoy this closeness, this, this oneness. Oneness is really the only word that you can use to describe what Jesus and the Father have, as well as Jesus and the Holy Spirit and the Father. It's a, it's a oneness. So that Jesus can say things like in John thirteen twenty, Verily I tell you, whoever accepts anyone I send... And that's in context, that's not the Holy Spirit, but that's the followers of Jesus going out. Verily I tell you, whoever accepts anyone I send, accepts me. And whoever accepts me, accepts the one who sent me. And in stronger language, in a couple of chapters later, John 15, 23, whoever hates me, hates my father as well. And Jesus asks elsewhere in John's gospel, he says in John 14, 10, don't you believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority. Rather, it is the Father living in me doing his work. You see, the Father is in the Son doing that which must be done. So they could say it's the Father's work. It's that type of oneness that they have, that we have just as. Just as relationship. Do you want to see the Father, Jesus says? You've seen me, you've seen the Father. It's that type of relationship. And it allows Jesus to say to his disciples, it is good that I'm going, but I'm going to send the Holy Spirit unto you. He's saying this, but he says, surely I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. So even as he says it's going to be the Holy Spirit, he says, it's, he says I'm with you. It's a oneness. It's a oneness. It's a just as relationship that we have with the Father. What makes Jesus the good shepherd? It's the gift of intimacy and relationship. And we hear what Jesus says in John 15, verse 9. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. How much are you loved by Jesus then? Just as God the Father loved Jesus. Just as. It's that kind of love. Abide in my love. And this is the greatest call that we have as believers is to to know and abide in this love that we have with God. What kind of love? The just as. But what are the implications of all this? I just want to take a few moments, run through seven implications of this relationship with the good shepherd that we have. The first one is that Jesus doesn't just save us from something but he saves us to someone you see we've been given that which is of greatest value in the cosmos and beyond and that's God himself that's God himself the forgiveness of our sins is a means to that end The end is God himself. Jesus died to bring us to the Father. And Peter sums it up this way in 1 Peter 3.18. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous. For what reason? To bring you to God. And as we look at this passage, we see this is the greatest thing that we could have. We've been saved to someone. Second um, implication is that it's an experiential and emotional one as well. It's not just intellectual. It's not just something that is cerebral and uh, up there in the thought patterns. It's an emotional reaction experience. First Peter 1 or 8 says, Though you have seen him, you love him. 
And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. An inexpressible Filled with glory, filled with this. It's more than just belief and knowledge. It's a love, it's a joy. Inexpressible. Why? Because it's a relationship just as the Father had with the Son that is ours in Christ. The third implication because it's an intimacy of relationship founded in the intimacy of the Father with the Son. It ensures that we will follow Jesus and Jesus only. Go back to the context of of going in and out of the gate. And you may remember in that earlier passage, verses 3 to 5, it says that they hear his voice. They follow the voice of the shepherd. The voice of a stranger they will not follow. It ensures that we follow Jesus fourth implication is that it's a relationship that is shared in the oneness in the body of Christ. That means that our oneness isn't only vertical. It's not only just us with Jesus and with God. It's you and I with one another within the body of Christ. And as I come and I worship with you, I worship as brothers and sisters in Christ. We've got a oneness that we share together. Jesus said in John 17, I've given them the glory that you gave me, that they would be as we are, one. So it's a oneness in the body, but fifth implication is that it means that we are to be those that are making Christ known. Our oneness with Christ Christ in us, us in Christ, we are one with another, testifies to the world that we are disciples of Jesus Christ. And Jesus said to his disciples, they will know that you are my disciples by your love for one another. And therefore it's a unity that should be what? Should be observable. It should be known. It should be seen as we relate to one another. And We have this unity in Christ. So we ask also there's the relationship um, that it's for all people. At verse 16, it says, I have other sheep that are not of the sheep pen. I must bring them also. They too will listen to my voice and there will be one flock and one shepherd takes us back we we looked in our church the week before we looked at what Jesus was referring to here and Jesus was referring to bringing people you and I into the kingdom not just the, those of the Jewish nation but it's something that's open to each and every person who will believe that's it's for all people And so we find the last implication for us is expressed. It's in our obedience. Our intimacy and our relationship with Christ Christ, is expressed in our obedience. Take a look at verses 17 and 18. The reason my father loves me is that I lay down my life only to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and authority to take it up. This command I received from my Father. And on our first reading of this couple of verses, we might think that it's the reason that the Father loves the Son is because he is obedient. As if it's, that's the path, um, the reason for it. But what we find is that Jesus love or being loved by the father was from before the foundation of the world it was eternal it wasn't conditional on his dying his dying and for us was linked to his relationship absolutely it was a natural outflow of it it was an expression of the oneness but it wasn't the condition for the oneness and so we find that 
we, these expressions of how we will follow and obey God. In, um, Jesus says in John fourteen fifteen, If you love me, keep my commandments. In John fourteen twenty one, Whoever has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me. The one who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I too will love them and show myself to them. And on and on in many passages, it's linked that if we love Jesus, if we love God the Father, we will. We will naturally obey his commands. Our obedience doesn't earn the love of God, but it flows from it. Our love of God is certainly expressed in our obedience. Their hand in glove. I want us to close by looking at the final t- uh, couple of verses here. Verses 19 to 21. The Jews who heard these words were again divided. Many of them said, he is demon possessed and raving mad. Why listen to him? And others said, these are, n- uh, these are not the sayings of a man possessed by the de- uh, demon. Can a demon open the eyes of the blind? It's great irony in all this. Jesus came to bring oneness, unity. But that mission which brings oneness also brings division. It brings division because you and I have a choice that we not only can make, but that we have to make. You see, we can either choose to believe that Jesus is, as he says, the good shepherd, the son of God. Or we can choose to believe that he's a demon, that he's demon possessed, that he's crazy. And we sometimes like to say it in terms like, well, you know, he's either God or he's, um, he's a liar and crazy. But you see, even to say that he's a liar, it, it deflects. Because only a crazy man would say the lies that he says. So either he's God or he's of the demon. He's of the devil. It's one or the other. And scripture is very, very clear that we have to understand that there's a choice that we make. To either follow him and accept him as the good shepherd or to reject him. Let me wrap up with giving you one more verse from the book of Hebrews. And the writer of the Hebrews says this, Now may the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep. And I love that because it's as if the writer of the Hebrews is saying, you know, Jesus called himself the great, the good shepherd, but that doesn't express it fully. He is the great shepherd. He's the great shepherd of the sheep by the blood of the eternal covenant and that he will equip us. He will equip us for everything good, for doing his will, and that he would help us to do that which is pleasing to him through Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory forever. May I suggest as I wrap up that this shepherd who would lay down his life for the sheep and give us that which is most precious and valuable really is a great shepherd. He's the only great shepherd. So who do you follow? Who do you follow? And if you don't follow Jesus Christ, why not? What more does he need to do to prove to you that he is good? Let's bow in prayer. Father, forgive us this morning. Forgive us for the many, many times that we deal so tritely with those things that you have said and done. We just gloss over them and move on our life as if they aren't very important. But Lord, these are the critical things of life. 
Lord, help us even in this day as we, we go on to other things to be remindful of the fact that you died so that we would have a just as relationship with you. And Lord, may that be so firmly fixed in us that we would rejoice in you knowing that you are the great shepherd of the sheep. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.